Hello, everybody. Welcome to this month's edition of Post Pro Res. I am John Pollock, along with WH Park. And WH, we are not alone this month. Who is our special guest? Well, it's my good, close, personal friend from the Eastern Lariat podcast. It's Dylan Fox. Dylan, how are you? Uh, I'm so happy to be here. And, you know, I thought, you know, you said that this is post pro res. John, I thought this was a complete rep- retrospective on Montreal that I was a part of, <laughs> unfortunately. <laughs> but, but no, but this is good, too. I'm very happy to be here. And this is, uh, you know, I've been a big supporter of uh, Rewind Away and all the things you guys have been doing for years and years, back to the original Facebook group. So this is a big thrill for me to be on this show with you guys at WH. As he said, we are very close friends. He's been on many Eastern Lariat shows, uh, and I'm very happy to be on and repay the favor. I was on a, a few months back. We were supposed to do this before, but there was a blizzard or something, uh, John, that you were stuck in. So now we're, we've are we got the gang together, and I'm so excited. It's one of the uh, the legitimate Canadian excuses we get in the winter where <laughs> there was there was a blizzard, and I was uh, – I was unavailable uh, to get on with you guys, but uh, you guys did a great show. We'll we'll try and live up to that standard today. We have a lot of news to get to, and then we're going to open it up to your questions that you submitted this month when we announced that we were going to be having Dylan on the show, so we will dedicate a portion of the show to those questions. And let's start off, guys, with New Japan, because just hours ago, they announced their plans for the G1 to go ahead with a 19-date schedule, kicking things off. Saturday, September 18th, they're going to do back-to-back nights at Edeon Arena in Osaka and then culminate with three straight nights at Sumo Hall, October 16th, 17th, and 18th. I'll start with you, WH, and as we were getting closer, uh, your thoughts just on New Japan embarking on a G1 and what this tournament is going to look like in terms of uh, participants, mainly the foreign representation that will be here come September and October. Um, I... I think it's very ambitious. I I would imagine this is the original like schedule that they had before, you know, the COVID pandemic. Um, I don't know if it's a good idea to run these many dates all across Japan because, you know, numbers are spiking, especially in the big cities like Tokyo, Osaka, and Nagoya and places like that. So I I don't know if it's gonna look like this. I don't even know if they're gonna be able to go ahead because like I think an imminent shutdown is gonna happen within the next month or so in Tokyo, especially. Um, as far as foreign participants, I don't see them getting anyone back. Like, you know, the borders aren't gonna be opening to any North American or European countries. Maybe they might be able to get like, you know, like the New Zealand guys, like Fale, um, Jay White, um, Hanare back, but that's about it. Dylan, this could be uh I mean it's their biggest tour of the year traditionally, and obviously they are now able to open it up to fans. But it just seems that even in these couple of weeks that they have been running and we've had the occasional person pulled due to precautionary reasons, that becomes so much more complex when you've got this heavily booked tournament where a guy missing a date can just throw everything into chaos. I think it's definitely an ambitious uh, time of the year to be running, uh, but also one that I mean, New Japan, it's it's so hand to mouth with running these live events that the idea of not doing a G1 is probably too daunting, given what they've already gone through this year. Absolutely. And I think that really is the motivation behind it, is the fact that it is so important to them monetarily. And as an American, I don't know if you guys are aware of this. Not the best at handling this coronavirus situation right now. So I'm really wary of really kind of predicting how things are going to go with shutdowns and things like that. Based on the numbers, I definitely agree with what you said, WH, that a shutdown has to be coming soon. But I I just I don't know what to think on a government level, how they're going to handle that. But at a New Japan perspective, very brave, very ambitious, as you said, especially do the sumo hall shows three nights in a row. But. Things are – I was actually listening to, a, you know, Re- Rewind the Dynamite, I think it was, and you basically said it's very hard to predict even a month from now yep. what's going to happen. And we're, and we're talking about a month or two from now, and I think that goes for New Japan as well. This pandemic has taken many forms, and, you know, there's been ebbs and flows to it dating all the ba- way back to March from the beginning of it in Japan itself. So uh, we're just going to have to wait and see on that end. But from New Japan's perspective, you look at them running the stadium – you know, this month, 
And then two months from now, planning for the G1 finals, the three straight sumo hall shows, just very brave. Who knows what could happen? They may end up having to have a condensed schedule, like some other tournaments that, you know, we've seen in Japan, but we'll ju- we're just going to have to wait and see would be my main advice on that. Yeah. D- Dylan, in terms of like the foreign talent, would you imagine that they are confident that they can get all of all of the outside talent in for this G1? Or could you see a scenario where we're, we're looking at the available talent that we're watching on these shows that this could make up a G1 if there are certain restrictions in place? Yeah, I, I definitely think that anybody in America right now is not going to be in Japan in time for the G1. So that takes out Kenta, you know, Finlay, Juice, all those guys are, are out of it. Osprey's in the UK. I think the same rule applies for them. Like WH said, potentially New Zealand could have their guys in, like Jay. And he's obviously. WH big, would riot if, yeah. if Jay White was not part of this tournament. I mean, that would just be it. <laughs> Yes, I mean, me too. And I, a classic favorite of both of ours, <laughs> WH. I know you're very excited to see him. You, you're clamoring for him to come back. I think we all all are. And uh, it's just going to be interesting to see how they do it. But again, I'm very wary of predicting the borders and the political ramifications of things. Uh, even guys like, you know, uh, Machine Gun Carl Anderson and Doc Gallows mm-hmm. have already talked about going to Japan, so we don't really know what's in the cards for these guys. Uh, but my prediction would be that nobody in America or the UK is going to be there in time for the for the G1, and fifty fifty on the New Zealanders. Hey, listen, let me tell you, I I make political comments on Twitter, nothing, no response. I say, hey, I don't miss Jay White at all. Oh my God, how dare you? <laughs> Maybe we'll get a. Uh... Maybe we'll get a uh, a faction of of mass men that will storm Sumo Hall with uh, chainsaws, and and they will be uh, th- the replacements uh, going into uh, Tokyo Dome season. Uh, they've got to fill up some of these empty roster spots. Maybe that can be New Japan's political statement. That could be it. Maybe they'll get uh, like uh, maybe Akira Tozawa will get his release, and he can bring his ninjas with him too. Jesus. Oh, oh. Just uh, looking at, at like booking wise, and this feels like a total shot in the dark given all the uh, things that we just outlined. But I mean, w- what do you see coming out of this G1? And and Dylan, starting with you, I mean, are you ex- like the fact that they are running a, a Jingu stadium? Like, do you see them doing a proper Tokyo Dome show come January if things are relatively close to the environment we see now in Japan? I think they are going to fight kicking and screaming to make that dome show happen, if at all possible. And just because they are a company, and the, WH can speak on this, a lot of companies there are really in love with their history, you know. So to have this streak of the January 4th dome shows, that means something to them, you know, as a company. Maybe not as much of a business sense, and I I can't speak on that. Only they know the exact numbers and things on that. But to me, I think they are going to try very hard to have this dome show to happen. Uh, Maybe not like it was last year with the or this year rather with the back to back dome shows. But for the January fourth show, I think they're going to try every means possible to make this happen. But uh, again, that may not even be possible by the time we get to January, but fingers crossed. I'm sure they had, they, I mean, look at this, look at this based on the G one schedule to have three straight sumo hall shows. Mm -hmm. You have to think they're, they're planning for the dome show in January. And maybe, yeah, this, I, I, maybe this is Ujiro's year, WH. <laughs> Ujiro to, to win the G1? <laughs> yeah, I mean, shit. I mean, he can he, he could get a, like, the what, the Lumberjack strap match? I mean, he, that's, that seems like his dream, more more than uh, headlining the Dome, or uh, maybe he'll get his, or Okada will get his, uh, you know, his dream of uh, three-on-one. Like, but to be fair, you know, like, that's not really a handicap match, because, like, Ghetto and Jado constitute, like, about half a wrestler. Really, if you think about it, oh, it it, it, it is a handicap match for for whoever is on the other side. <sighs> there, I would say in 2020, uh, that 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 can lead us into you know everything surrounding this Jingu Stadium card, which we are three weeks away from. We have, we have two matches so far with Evil and Tetsuya Naito, Hiromu Takahashi and Taiji Ishimori, and we know we're going to get a four way. 
consisting of the winners of four stipulation matches that will take place several days prior on August 26th, where the fans can vote on the stipulations presented by each side. And yes, the first stipulations laid out, Okada has asked for a three-on-one handicap match against Yujiro, Ghetto, and Jado, which sounds like a nightmare. The opposite is Yujiro presenting a lumberjack strap match with everyone on the floor armed with leather belts. WH, I read the details of this tournament when it was released, and I knew that they were just, they were after your heart. You clearly must have just thought, finally, more stipulation matches in New Japan. I think this is a great idea. Apparently, this is Okada's idea, and I'm just thinking, he must have been more influenced by the fucking booking team in TNA more than we ever thought, because this sounds (laughs) straight out of the fucking Vince Russo's playbook. Everyone has their uh, their libraries that they were checking out during the, the pandemic. I mean, maybe Okada just sat back and you said, you know what? Fire up some Impact, Impact Plus, and I'm going to go back and relive the glory days of like 2010, 2011 TNA booking. And boom, we got the King of Pro Wrestling title. I'm not a big fan of this thing, to say the least, but I will, I will reserve judgment to see how this comes off. But uh, Dylan, do you have uh, any strong feelings one way or the other about uh, – Yet another championship in this unique introduction. I mean, it's really what we all clamored for with New Japan. Not enough titles. I know. I think we've all had that criticism. And uh, like, but what are no, these guys I'm... fighting for? I mean, it's just like get <laughs> some gold in there. Yeah, exactly. It's a barren promotion when it comes to titles. And uh, as it turns out, some of them they can't even defend right now because of uh, things going on. But. This title, this King of Pro Wrestling title, if it's even a title, <laughs> you know, the, the the way they've set the rules up are basically like it's more of a three month title and then it kind of goes away <laughs> pretty much until the end of the year. But uh, just on one hand, I, on a positive hand, because on a base level, I hate this. I want it to be straight wrestling and, you know, all of that good stuff and stuff that I that got me to follow Japanese wrestling to begin with, but this is obviously the opposite of that. But on a positive hand, they're at least trying something different than doing the same stale stuff. And we all know that the October to January run is oftentimes really stale. You think this was the year they wouldn't need to do that because the G1 has, has gotten pushed back, but whoever's idea this was Okada's or, or whoever, it's just a really confusing and really kind of pointless title to me. If, if again, if it's even called a title, just very, very silly stuff, but it just feels like sometimes right now, John and, and WH that, Gato is just trying all kinds of different stuff to appeal to a lot of different audiences. They have this Jingo Stadium show, uh, Jingu Stadium show, that's obviously going to have a lots of different stuff that maybe we wouldn't see in, on a normal show. So they're at least trying something different. But will I personally like it? I would say that is highly unlikely. You know, they they don't have a title belt for this whatever the fuck this thing is, but I know <laughs> See, in, the, it's not in, the, a title. <laughs> in, in the press conference, like I saw it was either Kidani or Okada was holding a clipboard. That should be the title belt. That should be the, that's what you should be fighting over this fucking clipboard that has the new Japan logo and just says <laughs> KOPW on it. And that's what you're fighting for. You, maybe you can put that on a fucking pole or in a ladder match. Every match can be a ladder match. And that would just complete this whole fucking, uh, bullshit that i have to deal with uh, from from okada and ghetto the, the, the clipboard you know, can months. be all of ghetto's uh you know he goes back and rewatches all his memphis again and just takes out like all the stipulation ideas and then he can just keep keep track of which ones they've used you know just have a fucking concession brawl stand like i'm, I'm sure that's one of his favorite matches from memphis you know like what why do we have to go through all this like taboo tuesday cyber sunday wwe bullshit i don't know so you're a fan oh my god <laughs> that's, if that's the impression you get, John, then yes, I am I am a fan of this. Uh, we haven't spoken WH since uh, all of the uh, – th- with the title change involving Evil. Uh, he's going to headline against Tetsuya Naito. I hated this match that these two had a couple of weeks back. I don't think they can have a worse match uh, coming back here uh, at Jingu Stadium. But uh, what have you made so far of Evil and overall just the idea of elevating him to the championship picture uh, beyond just a Naito feud? Okay, I don't have a problem with the idea of elevating him. Like, like you got to do somebody. Okay, you do it with him. Um, 
But the thing is, is like he hasn't elevated himself in terms of like the way he works or the quality of his matches. They're the same like as like three months ago. And like I, I didn't like any of his matches in New Japan Cup. I didn't I hated the match with Okada. I hated the match where where he won against, you know, Naito. I hated the match with I didn't hate the match with Hiromu, but that's I hated what he did in it. I didn't I like what Hiromu did in it. But he hasn't done anything to make himself worthy of that title even after winning it like some people win the title because okay let's give him a chance like okada but then they rise to the occasion and then they have great matches evil hasn't done that and like i i don't see i don't see him keeping this belt i think the the title is going back to naito and i think you know there's a strong possibility that i think you know they might try to be built towards hiromu takahashi versus tetsuya naito at the tokyo dome if they have a tokyo dome in uh in january of 2021 WH, I just got to say, I really have to wonder, because this has really been speculated on a lot, about what was the original plan and such and such. I just have to believe that Evil joining Bullet Club was not in the cards. Like, I get what you're saying. and Elevating him, again, what you said is totally true. He himself... He's fine. You know, I, I've never had a strong opinion on him negatively, but this gimmick that he's in, I think more than anything, you said his, his matches are similar to three months ago, but they're actually much worse, in my opinion, due to this Bullet Club gimmick that he has. And that, that's really something that holds anybody back. But he's not he was not a top tier worker even before. And if you look at him at the start of the tournament, he's been mid card level for over a year now, pretty much. And that's being generous, you know, and we, we kind of mentioned that. I mentioned that on my show that he just hasn't really have had a lot of strong performances the last year, been in a tag team run, really been secondary to Sonata. So it just feels like they could have built to this whole thing a lot better and a lot more enjoyably than how they've done it. Because it was like he kind of came out of nowhere to win this New Japan Cup. And they gave him this huge heel gimmick. It's a ton of bullcrap, and I totally agree with you guys. That match totally sucked with Evil and Naito, I thought. Uh, there was really no positives to it. And the fact that he's going to very likely, maybe will be proven wrong, but very likely lose this title right back to Naito, just... Uh, it makes you wonder how much this is really going to do for him. Uh, just look at the Jay White run from last year. Uh, I don't feel like that run really elevated him to a new level where he was at. Uh, n no disrespect to Jay White, but I just don't think that one or two month title run really does a lot for these guys. It just feels like when they play like, you know, three or four years ago for, from now, when they show the IWGP championship opening during matches, he's going to pop up and we're going to be like, Oh yeah, remember when Evil won that title for, for a month? That was weird. And here, here I'm gonna make a bold prediction about this Evil Naito match beyond the fact that Naito's winning it. There's gonna be at least two ref bumps, uh, minimum two. It could be more. <laughs> so, someone's gonna get hit in the nuts, okay? Dick Togo's gonna garrot somebody, and that's before even the closing stretch of the fucking match. So that's you know, write that down and and please send me a tweet saying WH, you were right again. Again, being the operative word. Uh, last thing here on, on the New Japan front. They they have uh, kicked off their New Japan Strong series of shows on fr Friday nights here in uh, me and Dylan's uh, part of the world. Uh, they kicked off with the four tournament matches on Friday night. I don't know if you guys got a chance to see any of these. Actually, WH, I saw that you did get to see them. Uh, what did you think about... Like, d day to me, the biggest thing they have to overcome is just this completely empty environment, which I understand why they're doing that just from a safety perspective. But it, to me, was very tough. And I, I didn't think this was a uh, a blow away show, to say the least. I like you know, the first match called Fred yes. versus Kenta, I thought was fine because I think Ken that Kenta works wrestling. very well in this setting because of the kicks and his facial expressions. I think Kenta's style actually lends itself pretty well. You see a lot of that, like a lot of the good empty arena matches tend to be guys who like work really snug and are really good grapplers, and he's both. Um, and I like the Brody King versus Tamatanga match uh, as well. I thought Brody King made that match more than Tamatanga did, but the Cobb Tangaloa match I didn't think was. I thought it was pretty boring actually. And the Finley versus Chase Owens it was okay, but nothing exciting. You can skip those two if you haven't seen those yet. But I'd say Fredericks versus Kenta. Excellent. Go watch that. King versus Tamatanga it was good as well. But and that's all you need to see. But going forward, like I like the Lions Break Collision shows. I, I liked 
all of those shows because they were easy to watch. They were two matches. It was less than an hour. I hope they keep with that formula. They don't have to make this four matches every show. I, don't, I think that's a bad idea. Three is the maximum number and try to keep it within like a 50 minute time frame. I, I, I always like kind of, you know, limiting things to, you know, two, two to three matches. It's a very small ask of your audience. This is not like a must see show every week. And I think that that's, it, it does so sound though. Next week they were promoting the semifinals and they said, we're also going to have some tag matches. So that suggests we're getting, uh, probably four, four matches, uh, that we're looking at. Dylan, uh, how much interest do you have in any of these, uh, these strong shows and and the long term too about that like they could be cycling through this crop of talent for quite a while and just doing what they did for the lions break collision shows of bringing in other bodies to keep it fresh i think that they had a really great formula last month with, with those shows and i loved how they had uh the show was basically building up carl Fredericks and doing this storyline with Jeff Cobb that paid off. You had a very compact beginning, middle, and end, and you saw some new guys that you know maybe you'd never seen before, like Russ Taylor and, and all of these guys. Some great, very funny commercials <laughs> as well. Uh, I, if you guys haven't seen those, that's that's worth checking out. The shows alone is just for the commercials they have there. Uh, but it was a very compact format. I really liked it, and the strong show. I think. It, I think that this is really the opposite of what they're doing in Japan because it's a very basic old school booking mm -hmm. to have this new Japan Cup USA tournament. It's very easy to follow and not all the matches were bangers. Uh, John, you ha were totally right about the audience and the aesthetic of all of this. And I think that's something even in Japan, again, new Japan struggled with really heavily. I think their style in general compared to a lot of other Japanese pro wrestling companies are really dependent upon crowd reaction. So you'll see guys like a Taichi in Japan do his kind of match against Tanahashi and, and Ibushi. And it doesn't really work the same. If you're even a fan of that to begin with, uh, it just doesn't work the same without the crowd. And here though, pretty much everybody in this tournament outside of Tonga can work a, a you know, a very basic friendly style to this, environment and i thought fredericks did a great job kenta did a great job too but wh we have to talk about this what's up with the hair for kenta right now <laughs> you you got to give this a zero out of ten dude he, he he didn't want to get covid from his hairdresser like i can't blame the dude for like growing out his hair it's no i love his hair it's great it's a it's a, it's a different look for him i mean it's better than fucking master Wado. <laughs> setting the bar well, very, very that's high a very low bar. <laughs> Man, Ma Master Wato was all the rage last month, WH, when we did our show. And man, wh what a wave he just uh, rode for the last four weeks <laughs> into obscurity. Listen, listen like, y you thought Master Wato was going to win a title before Yoshihashi, but that dream has been ended. You know, Yoshihashi might actually get his first title and he'll beat Master Wato. And, and I can't think of a better, like, you know, better scenario for Master Wato than having Yoshihashi win a title before him. Wow, there, there you go. Some compelling stuff going on. Uh, let's move on over to uh, Pro Wrestling Noah. Um, behind the scenes, uh, a big merger involving uh, the, the various companies under the uh, cyber agent umbrella, including uh, DDT, Noah, and the most compelling of all, DDT Foods, which maybe that could be a faction <laughs> making its way onto its screen. Uh, Dylan, are you expecting that this is going to have uh, any kind of significant impact on on screen as opposed to it just being more of a kind of a consolidation behind the scenes i think it's interesting timing because noah also has this lidette kind of new group that kaz hayashi and nosawa are kind of involved with as well so not only do they have that starting up soon uh, maybe <laughs> like maybe things are, are changing uh, as the time goes along with the virus but you have that going on, and now this merger with the, the Cyber Agent family, including DDT Foods as well. We, we cannot forget about that illustrious group <laughs> that I, I know. Uh, WH, had, would you eat DDT Foods if they, would, they had a restaurant in Japan? Well, it wouldn't tell that I have to go to a DDT show. No, it'd probably it'd probably be like like some horrible, like one of those shit cat bays that they have in Japan, where like all the food <laughs> looks like shit. Like, like literally, it's designed to look like excrement and it's probably oh. something like that knowing ddt 
<laughs> well, I'm glad I've never heard of that, nor do I ever want to see one in person. But um, come for the wrestling, stay for the Yelp reviews. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. That's uh, we're bringing a new style to pro wrestling podcast right now. <laughs> so no one, that's no, good no, to no see. one ever grades the concessions game of some of these uh, promotions out there. So an- another area for okay. WH to navigate, I think, food. Listen, yes. John, I, I steered you the right way as far as food goes when you were in Japan in January. T- listen, Tokyo Dome, the best uh, the best food I have ever had at a wrestling show was at the Tokyo Dome. Nothing came close. That's wonderful. I, I, I hope one day to try the uh, the great food offerings at the Tokyo Dome. But this merger, I think, is going to be more of a behind-the-scenes thing for now. Uh, we kind of talked about this on the last show on the Eastern Lariat, but basically I think it's not that big of a deal in terms of on-screen stuff right now. And it, actually, if you look at how they book the shows, they're very careful to not like have them do any kind of crossover and mm-hmm. make you think that that's going to do a thing. Because if you look at the DDT show last – or well, two months ago now in the June show, the Peter Pan show, they did a feud with Noah, Keno, and Congo going to DDT. And they basically had one match, and then they were like, oh, well, we'll do our thing, and then you'll do yours, and we're just going to be apart for now. And they actually had a pretty decent feud that they kind of blew up for (laughs) seemingly no reason. So it feels like they're very desperate to make sure that all the fans know that, hey, Noah's going to stay Noah, and DDT's not changing either if you're a fan of one of those. So I think it's going to be a non-entity for now. But at at the end of the day, if things – keep going how they're going and money keeps bleeding out and i don't know if that's happening or not but you would think and they even said in their press conference actually that that really had a lot to do with this merger is that the the fact that the virus has kind of cut some things down for them Uh, if things continue on for another six months eight months 12 months who knows where we're going to be at then but for right now i don't think it will have any noticeable effect and if anything they're trying to make sure that you don't think that that happened that that is going to happen based on how they do their shows uh, we re- also are coming off the uh, the two departure shows at uh, Corcune Hall earlier this week that included uh, a new national champion with uh, Keno defeating Katsuhiko Nakajima. And then the following night, Go Shiozaki uh, defending the GHC championship, defeating Naomichi Marafuji. And that sets up uh, where they are going to do Shiozaki and Keno coming up in a double title match, WH. You know, I, I laugh when like these hardcore noah fans like you know i'll say ah oh, they're copying new japan the n1 victory tour that's copying and <laughs> come on and then they say no they're not that's just a coincidence okay how is a double title match not a fucking copy of new japan's double title like the ic title and the iwgp headweight title this is the same idea like apparently they're not going to defend them together like whoever wins these titles is not going to you know put both titles on the line at the same time but it's going to be like oh Today, I'm going to defend the, my national title. And the next day, I'm going to defend my world heavyweight title. But what's the point? Then why are you why are you merging these titles if that's what's going to happen? This is so stupid. Like, And I don't know why they put the belt on Keno. He's like, he's not that good. Like, I, I think he's a mid-carder. He's a guy who kicks, is angry all the time, and wears red. What the fuck's special about that? Nothing. He's, he's like a jobber to me. Like, I don't know why they push this guy. Like, keep the belt on nakajima if you're gonna do a double title match build towards the money match that they have in noah and that's nakajima versus shiozaki like the tag partners who haven't touched uh in like in in like a serious title in like a serious match or even for a major title in like years i'm just picturing a guy in noah or in noah just running around in like a red turtleneck and pants angry all the time kicking dudes and i don't think it's the worst <laughs> idea at all like that that sounds like a great prototype um I- Brilliant gimmick idea. We're also getting this double title match on like several days notice. This is happening on Monday. So they they beat Adam Cole and Keith Lee to a double title match on next to no notice uh, by by multiple weeks, actually. That was going to be my point, actually. Uh, you, you know, you could say that they copied New Japan, but I disagree because they did what New Japan did, but just – in a really much worse way than how New Japan did it, because at least you had the whole build to the Dome with the tournament and all of that to finally unify these titles. And another problem with this is that the national title is not even a year old, and they're already trying to do this double title thing. Uh, It really has no true meaning. I mean, it's been a a fine addition to the company. They've had good matches because they've had people like Sugira hold the title, who, who always have great matches, Nakajima, great worker. 
Uh, I just I don't understand this idea at all. It's really silly booking, in my opinion. And, you know, Keno, I, I like him as a talent. If you go back and watch his Michinoku Pro days, big fan of that run. And Noah, I feel like they've never quite grasped what made him special there on the smaller scene. And they've kind of given him these weird characters. You know, when he first came in, he had the kendo stick and the, the super heel stuff with Chokibo Goon. And then they did this very angry character. Uh, you know, what John said, the way you <laughs> said his gimmick like that, that actually sounds pretty cool and awesome. <laughs> but the, the the way he does it, though, there's a way to do always angry. Like on paper, a, a guy who hates everyone and is always mad and kicks people very hard is a great gimmick. But the way he does it, and just how they kind of position him a lot of the times, he more or less comes across like a whiny baby to me, more than a badass. And like, you know, he, there's been times he's had temper tantrums. Another problem, his faction, Congo, always loses. <laughs> That's a very uh, noteworthy thing about him and his group this year. So he kind of come, you know, I don't want to say came out of nowhere, but it wasn't the best build to this. And now we're doing this, you know, four, no, five day build to <laughs> this double title match. And it's just weird. I mean, what what is the best case scenario of this match with Keno and Go? Uh, Go is somebody I feel for a lot because every time this guy gets a title, pretty much, it feels like he's snake bitten in some way. Uh, back to his very first run, and now with the virus coming in, it's really derailed his whole reign. But this this double title thing, I just I have no clue what, what what this is all about. Just a very strange show. That could be a show with a lot of crazy booking things if Muto beats. Kaito as well, the semi-main. So we may have a, a terrible show to talk about uh, in the coming weeks as well. This is a wild show, just when you look at, yeah, the, these top two matches uh, from Yokohama Bunka High School. A far cry from the Tokyo Dome to do your, your double title match. Is this like a legit high school <laughs> WH, or is this, am I underselling the prestige of this place? I I, I think that's the, the Bunka Gymnasium. Like, that's yeah. where, like, they have all the, the shows. Is that right, Dylan? It's the Bunka Gymnasium? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, I think it's, maybe I've, I have copied something that had high school on it. So, anyway, I could be um, I, I think here. high school – If I think high school events are held. I've, I've seen tons of, like – I've seen Noah and Big Japan there. It's a, it's a nice building, but they're tearing it down, and right. they're going to build the new Budokan, like Yokohama Budokan. Uh, it's going to be unveiled, like, I think this fall, which <laughs> to me is crazy. But, hey, it's Japan, like, during this pandemic. But what, what can you do? Uh, any thoughts, WH, on the uh, the main events? I I saw the uh, the Nakajima uh, Keno match. I I did like the finish. Like I like doing stoppages every now and then. Um, but yeah, I I, I thought really it was uh, Nakajima that really shined in this whole thing. And my highlight was the first two minutes where they were teasing, uh, doing their 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 iteration of Go and uh, Fujita. <laughs> Oh, I was so worried that that's what they were going to do. <laughs> Thirty minutes of staring at each other. I I didn't mind the finish. I don't like. I think Dylan, like on your reviews of these shows, like that that match, you said it was okay. But my I think I shared the sentiment that it just came out of nowhere. There was no build to that kick and the knockout. And the other thing is like it was just kicky. It's just they kicked each other. Yeah. And and I like Katsuhiko Nakajima a lot. But when he's fighting someone who d- does the same thing as him, it's either going to be a hit or miss. If he's fighting Kenta. It's a hit. If he's fighting Masaki Mochizuki, it's a hit. If he's fighting Keno, who doesn't know how to do anything but kick and stomps and yell, then it's, it's a miss because this guy is not a compelling wrestler. He's not a diverse wrestler. And Nakajima has to carry it. But, like, again, like 85% of his offense is kicks and slaps. And it's like that gets tired after tiring after a while, especially like how long was this match? Like over like 27 minutes or something like that? That's, that's too yeah. much. It's too much of this kick, 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 kick. Okay, I'm tired of this. It's like, you know, like Nagata Suzuki. I like that match. But again, it's just them slapping each other. I didn't, I, after a while, I'm just like, okay, what else are they going to do in this match? And then finally he hit the gotcha pile driver. And I was like, okay, thank God it's over. It wasn't bad, but I didn't think it was as great as like a lot of other people thought it was. And then I got goes for this Nakajima Keno match too. Yeah, I think another thing to note on that whole show, especially even more than the second night, I thought the crowd was really bad uh, when it came to the entire show, pretty much. And the way that they did the knockout finish, again, on paper, I think it's awesome because it's not something you see a lot of. But they have gone to this well, and people were messaging me on Twitter about this, uh, too, after the, the show happened. And they've gone to this well before with Keno, and it always comes across kind of like you said, WH, where it just kind of came out of nowhere. 
kind of a flat finish, maybe not too uh, exciting as it could have been. I think Keno, I don't think he's that bad as a talent. I, I think he's actually, I mentioned this on my review, he's got something that makes him kind of unique if you just watch the way he moves around the ring. And this is something like Ikuto Hidaka in Zero One formerly uh, has as well. Just watching him move around the ring, I think he has a unique style. But like you said, he leans too much into the all kick offense. And I, I kind of mentioned this on my review as well. There just wasn't any more depth to it than two guys who kick hard. But uh, still, I think it would be better than their original version of this match, which happened a couple of years ago before Nakajima had his character change, where it's like, oh, two stoic guys who kick hard. <laughs> like, you know, that, that's all there was to it. Here, at least you had a little bit more personality with Nakajima, but the crowd really took hampered it as well. They, this went way too long. And I know a lot of people love this match, but I'm really agreeing with you, WH. Uh, this was a solid match. You know, again, like a six or seven out of ten, three and a half stars, whatever. You know, three, three and a half stars. I think that's where I would have it. But uh, it could have been a lot better. I'd like to see them have a match in a in front of a real crowd and shortened down. But th- this didn't blow me away either. I, I think on a larger scale, I think that there's like several companies that could really capitalize on this period of time and give people like some dynamite. 14 15 minute main events i think it would be refreshing mm-hmm. across the board because we're in this glut of every main event's got a top 25 minutes or it's not main event worthy and i'm so against that that line of thinking and it's not it's not every single example but far too many where that it, it, like if evil and naito go 35 minutes which is what i'm expecting at the end of august like that's just death when that match should be going a fraction of that time well, you know what that means, John? It's time to bust out Noah Underground for some real quick matches. That's right. I think by, it's the best out. You win option. by having Shane McMahon declare. That's it. You can't take any more. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. That that is the big plan to change Japanese wrestling. Okay. Well, I, I think most of most of the title matches I've seen that you know aren't like going past thirty minutes. Like I think my favorite title match so far has been the Shitara Shina versus Sawama Triple Crown match. Outside of the finish, I think Shina should have won that match. But I thought that was a great title match. And I don't, I don't think it wore out its welcome, actually. You know, I think it was a really well-paced match that, like, went as long as it needed to. Yeah, well, I mean, when done well, it's it can be very effective, like, when you, when you have that. It just becomes when it feels like it's the obligation that we have to hit this time, it's – you're forcing it on people. And I think that is where it becomes – you wear it out and the idea of going 30 minutes it's it's not a novelty it becomes the standard and i think that that is where people are going to be i think more critical of a match that goes 30 and kind of is good but is a drag throughout the middle as opposed to just a hot 18 minutes and people are left wanting more so it's always that balance uh going over to stardom right now uh wh you've been very high on stardom of late and they have just kicked off their five-star grand prix uh running on saturday and then they're coming back on sunday as well with the uh the blue and red star blocks um what are some of your uh standouts over the the past couple of weeks with uh with stardom they had uh, two big shows near the end of july and then uh kicking off the grand prix i i've really loved like a lot of the stuff involving julia's faction down at del mundo like they had a artist defense of the trios title against oedo tai which i thought was really good and then they had this excellent like eight woman tag match all four members of donna del mundo taking all four members of queen's quest and that went to a time limit draw and i just thought they just had me like engrossed in the the different combinations of each member fighting against each other like trading rivalries within like each each faction against each other like himeka versus utami momo against uh, shiri kondo and all, all these things and i was that was a great match i, I love the the jungle kiona Mayu Iwatani match. That and match was I awesome. Re- I love that match. Yeah, and, that was a great and, match. And I think, and I, and I, and I really like the Tom Nakano Julia Wonder Stardom like uh, a title decision match. And to me, like Julia's like just been a really great asset to Stardom. And I, and you, you, you thought maybe okay, Stardom's going to have some problems because they lost. You know, two of their stars off. Obviously, one of them is, is you know, Hannah Kimura, unfortunately, passing away. And then Arisa Hoshiki, Hoshiki like, retiring due to injuries. And you think, okay, well, are they are they going to be shorthanded in terms of, like, match quality and for their main events? And I, and I don't think that's been a problem. I think, you know, both Junko Kiana and Tom Nakano stepped up to their respective spots on this 
past tour. And I think, you know, going forward, they, they are very keen on pushing like Utami Hayashishida and Momo Watanabe. And I would also think like Tom Nakano has got to be in that conversation. Like, I don't think she's ready for that spot right now in terms of like actually winning a title. But I think given her progress over the last several, you know, several years, like by next year, she's keeping this progress. I think she can be in a spot where she can be called upon to be a, a champion and main event a lot of shows consistently. I really love those matches, uh, you know, both of the ones with the red belt and the white belt. Uh, the tournament's very interesting. You've had some, you know, th- changes from the years prior, and obviously the now we've seen some fresh things. I didn't really love the booking. I kind of mentioned this. It feels like every company right now, one of their favorite things is to have a really hot challenger and then have them lose right, right away. And, you know, no no disrespect to Mayu at all because she's an amazing worker. Everybody knows this. But to me, the the way the story was built up, for both of those matches, the guy, the girl who retired and the girl who died, even both of those matches, it really felt like if there was a time to go forward with Jungle, I thought that was it. Uh, Tom as well, I thought would have had a great story with Ho- Hoshiki, but they went away from that. I think Nakano definitely has hope that she will get redemption, though, uh, more so than Jungle in this tournament. I think that she is ready uh, talent-wise. If you look at her storytelling ability, the things she's done over the past year, she had an amazing feud with Hoshiki last year. I thought it was one of the best feuds in all of wrestling. And she's somebody that I, I'm always really amazed by because I used to really think she was nothing special at all, kind of a negative, actually, total idol type of wrestler, which doesn't appeal to me as much. But somehow she's really improved a lot, I feel like. Julia, I love Donna Del Mondo because it's like, here are all these great indie workers. Let's just, if we, let's start them, let's sign them and put them with Julia. I thought that's a great move. Shuri, uh, Jumbo Arita, uh, Himika, obviously, in stardom. They put them both in Donna Del Mondo. It's a great group, like you said. Uh, the tournament looks really cool. I think, like you said, Momo Watanabe and uh, Yutami Hayashishida are going to be the two to watch. I think they have to be the two favorites to win the tournament right now. Uh, Tom, I think, would be a great story. I just don't think the way they built it up, I think they're more, uh, you know, she just had her title shot, so it's going to be hard to kind of go with her. But I'm very interested to see where they go. Julia has done a, a very good job as well. I agree with you on that. Uh, the tournament as a whole looks really good. They they had some interesting results from the first night that just happened, what, a couple of hours ago at this point. So uh, interesting stuff there. Uh, Himika, too, has got a lot of buzz for some people as a sleeper candidate to, to get a big push going forward, and she deserves it. She's an amazing worker. So uh, all kinds of cool people in stardom to follow. I would definitely recommend the Five Star Grand Prix. And it's such a cool tournament, too. This is something – you just to capitalize on your point, John, just a second ago, all the matches have a 15-minute time limit. So you could watch a whole tournament or a whole show, and none of them is going to go over 15 minutes. You're not going to have a 30-minute match or anything like that. Uh, they're all – really well done and it does provide for some really cool stuff because you could have more likelihood of a draw in a 15 minute setting than a 30 minute so i think it's a really great tournament to watch great characters and some really good wrestling too yeah and uh just to go back to the uh the jungle kiona um title challenge with uh mayu iwatani if you i highly recommend the match but afterward though the it, like i don't even want to call this a promo but she just breaks down crying about the struggle to prepare for this match uh coming off Hanakamura's death and it was just like a super emotional uh promo afterwards and she ne- she never actually says Hanakamura's name but like everyone knows what the story is of like what she had to struggle to go through leading to this match and she's here in her hometown of Nagoya and it was really something I thought WH and followed um a, a, an outstanding match as well like of the two main events I I thought this was uh this was my favorite of the two yeah, I, I, I like Jungo Kion. I've actually been very high on her. And I, I think you could you could put the red belt or the white belt on her and she would do really well as a champion. I, I unfortunately think like the current management of stardom, the you know, Rossi Ogawa, he's the booker of the company. Like I, I don't think he, he looks at her that way. I think he looks at her kinda like how New Japan looks at Hiroki Goto. I think she's like the yeah. Hiroki Goto of stardom. That like like she's a utility player and but she could be more. And I think like Hiroki Goto could have been more, but like he's been slotted. I think Jungle Kiona has been slotted, which is unfortunate. I, I, hopefully, maybe if she does another makeover, like 
you know, it joins another faction or in like when they do the stardom draft in, in you know, like whenever that is, I forget um, that maybe she's going to have a chance to kind of like elevate herself even more. Because like this association with Tokyo Cyber Squad really did her a lot of, you know, good in terms of like elevating her and getting her to another level as far as her, her persona and her character and her presentation before then when she was in with like Jungle Assault Nation, which was, you know, it was OK, but it was never going to go beyond what it was. Man, I love Jungle, and that breaks my heart because I think I've cursed two people because Goto is my favorite wrestler in New Japan, and Jungle Kiona is my favorite in stardom, and they're destined to be in this role of always uh, hovering around that level, trying to knock on that glass ceiling, but never being able to break it. But I do agree with you, and unfortunately, to me, I think she's one of the best uh, wrestlers. Uh, I also want to point out that she does my old finishing move as well with the Kiniku Buster, how I did it. So I, I automatically love that but her match with Hoshiki last year was one of the best matches of the year. That had to be a top 10 match in my book. And this match with Mayu, it's an amazing match this year too. So she's got a strong list of amazing work to her name, but just what, for whatever reason, like you said, maybe it's management that doesn't see it in her Uh, for whatever reason. It just, she's just stuck in this role, but I think they really had something with her, but uh, John, I do agree. Her promo after the match was incredible, just unbelievable. You know, it wasn't even acting. It was almost real, you know, (laughs) pretty much, but absolutely. Yeah. 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 She, you know, so great stuff all around for her. I don't think she's going to be a threat to the tournament, unfortunately, but she's going to have a lot of great matches and probably some really good performances overall as well. Yeah. It it should be a very, very hot uh, tournament from uh, the, with the Grand Prix. And yes, that kicked off on Saturday. Uh, I do want to get to these questions, WH, but anything you want to just touch upon um, regarding all Japan and big Japan uh, things that you wanted to note? Well, I, I think just for time's sakes, like I just want to talk about that. The, you know, all Japan announced the the blocks for the Champion Carnival, and Block A is Suwama, Zeus, Jake Lee, Kuma Arashi, and Jiro Ikeman Kurushio. So that's the that's the shit block, by the way. So I feel really sorry for Jake Lee in that Block B: Kento Miyahara, Shuji Ishikawa, Yoshitatsu, Yuba Aoyagi, and Shitaro Shino. And that's the good blog, even with Yoshitatsu in it. Uh, so that's there, what there I'm is a notable contrast about. there. <laughs> um, and I'm gonna make a prediction. I think it's gonna be Ashino against Jake Lee in the finals. Winner gets Suwama for the Triple Crown and will become the Triple Crown champion. And my hope is it's Shitara Ashino because that's who the hottest wrestler in all Japan is. <sighs> when is Ikemen leaving WH? <laughs> That's that's my question at all of this. There's all these silver linings to this COVID, like no brawling in the crowds, no no Chase Owens and Jay White in New Japan. But there's also the really bad things, and that's Jiro Ikimen Kurashio being in All Japan Pro Wrestling, and I have to watch him team up with my my boy Kento Miyahara. Yes, a wonderful faction uh, they've got Kento in right now. And Jiro, he does get to live his dream of going to the Champion Carnival. Um, the top half of the block isn't too bad, but Kuma has been pretty mediocre since he's come to All Japan. And Jiro is probably one of my least favorite wrestlers personally to watch. So I'm not excited about his tournament, but Jay could have a great match with Zeus. I want to see Zeus. They're getting away from the dumb Purple Haze crap, which I hated so much when, when they did it. So I'm the, really WH happy to see that. WH that gimmick. He, he thought it was awesome. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, Purple Haze defender right now, so I don't want to step on anybody. But just uh, definitely a, a nominee for worst gimmick of 2020 for sure for me. Uh, so I think that could be good. B Block, like you said, has some great matchups. Uh, Aoyagi is somebody I really think is kind of underrated, yes. actually. I his title match versus Kento was so good. Uh, the buildup of it was so good. It actually did a, a way better than expected number two. Uh, I think this guy has star potential. They just haven't. He lost his title match, and they just never did anything with him afterwards. So I want to see them get up back on track with him. Give him a big win over somebody, whether it's Kento or something. I, I think Aoyagi really deserves a lot of credit. But I agree with you, WH. Ashino is the pick for quality standpoints. I I have to say, I think Jake... And Ashino would be the favorites, but there is a possibility. I wouldn't put it at zero percent that Kento just wins the tournament. And get, they go go back to him just based on their history of win in danger, break glass, 
and it's Kento. And I think that could be a case here, but I'm hopeful that Ashino is the pick as well, even though he did lose his match already. And another booking decision, possibly my least favorite booking decision of them all was that, but uh, it should be a really good tournament overall. I actually don't mind the lower number of people in the blocks because it cuts out a lot of filler guys. Like no offense to Ryoji Sai, like he's cool and all like good mid card guy, but I'm not losing sleep over a guy going three or four, no chance to win at all. Uh, let alone some of the guys like, you know, Valletta or whatever. It's like, these guys have no chance to win. So I have no problem cutting them out to get to the meat of the tournament. I, I think it's actually kind of a good format. I'm always in favor of the world cup style of tournament with four blocks of five. I think that would be kind of cool for something like this, but this with 10 guys, they're all the main inventors, pretty much. Uh, not all of them have a chance to win, like Yoshitatsu <laughs> or anything like that. But still, I like that they cut to the meat of the tournament, and I think it should be a really good run for them. Maybe in a month or two, WH, you can compile a top 10 list and rank the top 10 Japanese tournaments going on over the next month or two. <laughs> I'm, I'm hoping we're going to get like five more announcements of uh, five more uh, tournaments before the end of the year, John. I mean, Christ, it's uh, like if you include this King of Pro Wrestling thing, we, we have like, in essence, three tournaments going on right now in New Japan. Yeah, and I'm, we I'm sure they're getting. I'm sure we're we going to get something yeah. announced from DDT and Big Japan and and like Wave and and, and Ice Ribbon <laughs> or something as well. So my my favorite would be if they go through this whole tournament on New Japan Strong for a U.S. title shot, and then in a month or two we have to do a tournament for the vacant U.S. title. Exactly, <laughs> and the winner of the tournament gets because... the number one seed or something. <laughs> And we don't even know what's going to happen with the best of the Super Juniors if if they're going to do that, too. So that could be another tournament that that could potentially come in. Well, it is, uh, yes, tournament, tournament heavy. Let us go over now to forum.postwrestling.com. We threw this thread up, and when we said Dylan was coming, the the messages just kept swarming in. So we have a a lot of questions here to get through. And we're going to kick things off with our man, Neil. And he says, outside of New Japan, there seems to be a large number of successful promotions in Japan. Can you guys outline the current size and popularity of the notable companies? For example, which are comparable in scale to an independent such as OTT in Ireland? And he's asking, which which companies are big enough to offer uh, a full-time living to the performers? Uh, we can start with you, WH. Um, like, as far as the first part, which one is comparable to OTT? Um I I suppose it would be all Japan. Like I I don't think any like Noah or DDT because of their affiliation with Cyber Agent are are at a higher level than that. But I think you know all Japan is a kind of comparable operation to OTT. And as far as being able to make a living, pretty much all of them you can make a living. Like you know all, obviously New Japan you can make a living. All Japan most of those guys are full time you know employees of the company. Uh, definitely Noah and DDT because of the, the you know the parent company of Cyber Agent. Um, most of the Stardom wrestlers obviously can are full time you know make a full time living wrestling only. Uh, Dragon Gate. Then I think it just gets a little dicey from there. Like um, you also like the way you have to understand about like smaller companies in Japan how like the roster members make money is to sell tickets to fans. Like, that's why a lot of, especially with Joshi companies, like the smaller ones you'll see in their Twitter handles, they'll have an email address. That's not to contact them for a date. That's to buy a ticket from them, okay? Because <laughs> So that's how a lot of, like, Dragon Gate actually does this as well, where they give a block of tickets to their wrestlers, and these wrestlers have to go out and sell these tickets to make part of their income. And sometimes... In a zero one uh, company, I really think you have to look at who's backing these companies if you want to, you know, look at who the pay scale, so to speak. Like obviously, Bushi Road and their companies are, you know, you're going to be fine if you work for one of them. Cyber Agent, you're going to be fine. Then you get to some, uh, like you said, a kind of shadier territory, so to speak. But that WH made a very good point. Uh, it's almost like a mom and pop operation in some of these smaller uh, indies where it's like everybody comes together. Even in Dragon Gate, like guys will have secondary jobs like so-and-so would be a graphic designer i think bb hulk uh was like a guy who designed a lot of the graphics and stuff like that and a lot of the merchandise and so and so would be a trainer and so and so would carry the tickets and like you know it would be a very uh family type of organization for that group and 
the lower I, I once you get below that i think it'll be pretty tough uh you know if you're at a mo- basement monstar level a uh, company uh, i just don't think you're going to be making a living in secret base but for the name companies you should be pretty uh, you know like you said if you work hard enough you'll have a shot at it uh john Sino, he says going back and watching old new japan matches from the first jingu stadium show Obviously, New Japan used to do a lot more death matches or gimmick style matches. What was the driving force from getting away from this? And how are those matches and that era looked upon now from current New Japan? We'll throw that one out to uh, to Dylan. Uh, Enoki did a lot of crazy things in his day, was a lot of the impetus behind this. Even back to way back with the island death match with Saito, Hiroshi Hase as well had one of those. Uh, for whatever reason, you know, New Japan was presented as the king of sports, but then you would have these crazy matches at times. And obviously in the late 90s, they had the hardcore matches with Onita coming in and stuff like that. Even in the mid 2000s, they had stuff like. Uh, Tanahashi and Murakami in an empty arena steel cage match. The original empty arena version of New Japan all the way back in like 2004. Ensign Inoue was there. It was just a a crazy time period with all of that going on. They really got into it around 06 when they did the WrestleLand stuff. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of what this uh this t- king of pro wrestling tournament feels like is like bringing back WrestleLand <laughs> almost but for whatever reason after Inoki kind of left and they had the new owners they've kind of gotten away from that but I definitely don't think he he said in his questions that similar to how WWE had the attitude era no <laughs> it was it was not like that uh, at all unfortunately it was a very dark period actually when, when they really did a lot of that stuff uh, just trying to throw stuff against the wall to evolve and even in the late 90s when they did that that was a problem with a lot of companies uh, you know they had the glory era in the early 90s even all Japan and then they were trying to find places to evolve like FMW like really changed their style to more of a sports entertainment deal uh, where you guys is good friend Dan the mouth Lavransky commentated some of those for the English version yes. that I watched um you know so a lot of guys were a lot of these companies were trying different things just to evolve from the early 90s but uh why they got away from it uh well we're gonna if this is a big failure this king of pro wrestling i think you may have an answer to that well it's one of the things about doing a lot of these like stipulation style matches it's that the 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 concept of a stipulation is that it's going to enhance interest in a match, build up to a big match. And to me, it's the fact that we're just going to throw like four of these on one show and they're just being thrown out there. To me, it's like a stipulation for the sake of a stipulation. And it just feels like it's a crutch we're leaning on during this period where Ghetto has access to less people and feels like we need to have all these shiny toys literally as it, uh, almost a distraction method to that. Yeah, I think, you know, getting to the part, like, how did, like, old, like, longtime fans look at these matches? I I think they looked at them once in a while. Oh, okay, that's that's interesting. I, I don't think they like any of these matches. You see the, the famous Ricky Choshi, Asushi Onita, like, uh, match with the, the death matches, like, aspect of it. Like, Onita's coming down. People are booing him and throwing trash at him because they legit <laughs> fucking hate him because, like, he epitomizes everything that they hate about what they call in Japan garbage wrestling, deathmatch wrestling, you know? Um, and so, like, those 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 fans of New Japan, All Japan, traditional wrestling, they don't really like the gimmicky stuff. Like, they'll accept it once in a while, but if they think it's going to come in and ruin their what they like about the promotion, which is pr- probably, like, you know, pure, high-level, high-impact wrestling, then they're not going to accept it. And I, I got to think, like, you know, like, the dark, the dark period of New Japan wrestling, where you had a lot of, like, gimmicky stuff with the MMA fighters coming in and stuff like that, there's a reason why that's a dark period, because that stuff wasn't appealing to the, the, the hardcore New Japan fans, like, who wanted to watch wrestling and see good storylines and things built up towards titles and things like that. So I, I don't think... I think this, all this stuff now is because of the pandemic and Ghetto's like just trying to get garner interest in and get people to come buy tickets for these shows. Mm-hmm. Next one here is from Benjamin. Uh, he wants to know our thoughts on Gabriel Kidd. I'm a huge fan and have been for a while. Would like to know your thoughts on him as a wrestler. He was also a huge fan of the Mayu Iwatani Jungle Kiona match, uh, which we talked about earlier. But uh, WH, where is Gabriel Kidd in terms of your uh, long-term optimism when it comes to the Young Lions? Oh, I, I like him a lot. I wasn't really familiar with his stuff in the United Kingdom, 
but I had heard his name here and there. Um, since he's, you know, been wrestling for New Japan, especially during this pandemic, I, I think he's acquitted himself really well. Um, I think they've been giving him a pretty decent push for a young lion. He's got like, you know, interactions with Makabe and he's got that, he had the singles match with Nagata, which is, you know, that's not very common for a young lion, especially a foreign one to, to get those opportunities. So I think, you know, within a two year time frame, like I can see big things happening for him if his progress, if it, the progress of his work, you know, continues at a certain pace. Yeah, totally agree. F- Fredericks, Connors, a kid. All have bright futures, I think, uh, you know, as, as more of the English speaking talent that are young lions in New Japan. I think those guys are all very good. A kid has really established himself. And I really love the story of a guy who was already doing his own thing in his own country, but traveled to Japan to go through the dojo and make his way there. So I think that's really cool. And I like him, too. I think he's a really good young lion. Uh, and uh, no, you're not alone, by the way. The Jungle Mayu match was very good. We all liked it very much. Uh, King of DDT, all I'll say is I haven't watched the first shows or anything like that, but Minoru Tanaka is in it, and so that means I will watch anything with Minoru Tanaka, watch all of his matches, and the rest, uh, you know, it's, it's, up, it's, it's up to you what you subscribe to as a fan, but definitely watch his matches, I would say. Yeah, might be a candidate for the top 10 tournaments. Uh, Jake yes. writes... <laughs> Do you guys think that New Japan will have to strip John Moxley of the U.S. title because he can't get across the ocean to wrestle for them at the moment? And I'll add to that, Dylan. Like, what do you think is the like the time frame of when of how long they will wait till they have to make a decision on what they do with that title? You would think, you know, the way things have gone, you could argue that. Maybe they should have done it already uh, yeah. based on the, the way the titles have gone. But uh, it's it's really trying to get into the mind of G- of Gato. And some people would say he is a madman. So uh, it's a da- it's dangerous territory we're entering. But they've already done the tournament for the title. Uh, like you said, it would just be so cheesy if they did this whole tournament and then stripped the title. And then you had another <laughs> a number one contenders tournament and a tournament for the championship. I just think... They can't allow that to happen. They must have planned this out a little bit better for that. So I think at the very least, they will go forward with this tournament and have something with that. But then you have the AEW contract, so you never know what what the deal is with that either. Uh, And maybe it'll all come to a head where things get shut down for months and months, and they have to get this title back because we need the U.S. title in Japan. Uh, We cannot go without it. So perhaps that day will come eventually. I just have to think as well, WH, is that if ever there was a time that AEW would not be doing a solid for New Japan, it's now. I would never – like yeah. if, if I was Tony Khan, like even if I wanted to explore relations with New Japan at some point, I'm not sending this guy anywhere that it could potent- – like forget COVID. Like he could get hurt. Like I would just not be taking that risk at all right now to be doing uh, a favor for anyone right now. And it's not even out of maliciousness. It's just out of my own business interest. So I can't see any time period in the near future and maybe even long term future that Moxley is doing any non AEW dates. And like you got to think that, you know, they want to get the title off of him because of his AEW contract that he can't work for anyone else in the United States. And, you know, to your point, like if I'm Tony Khan, I'm not letting my world champion do any jobs to anyone yeah, let yeah. alone in the, in the united states so like that's that's insane to think that they're they're gonna not strip him the title i think by the time the finals come around they're probably gonna say okay we stripped him of the title and this is now yeah. for the title i can see that being the scenario that plays out and they, there's this kind of i think they're teasing this idea like if they don't say they strip moxley they're creating like co- a conversation online about oh who's how are they going to do the match with Moxley? Because people talk about this. So I think it's kind of smart on New Japan's part to not say they stripped Moxley the title, but I think ultimately that's what they're going to have to do. Uh, we go to MJ from NJ, and his question is, what is the typical TV schedule for Japanese pro wrestling? Uh, yeah, he's – I've always been curious where local audiences find the shows for consumption, uh, asking is it just as simple as New Japan World and – also, I know WH hates guys like Kenny Omega and Jay White. I've always understood the rise of the, the non-Japanese wrestler in Japan to be mostly heel personas. Does the disdain for these wrestlers stem from not liking their work or because they are effective in their heel roles as presented as outsiders to Japan? 
Okay, so the the first part of the question about how do people find Japanese wrestling on television, um, they just find it. Like they go to Samurai TV, they subscribe to a service like Nico Nico, they buy the streaming platforms because Japanese wrestling is not on primetime television. Well, you know, New Japan just got on to primetime television in the worst possible time. But like in terms of like, you know, this COVID pandemic, but they got on to like, you know, what, Friday nights at 8 p.m. or something like that, right on yeah. TV. Yep. That's great. Like that, that's going to raise their profile. But for the longest time, they were like slotted to, you know, Sunday nights at 6 a.m. or, you know, Friday nights at 2 a.m. or, you know, on G plus, you know, Samurai TV or whatever, the, which is all things you have to pay for. Like Japanese wrestling exists on cable on like, for example, platform like Gaura, which has all Japan and, and, and Dragon Gate for the most part and some other companies. But for the most part, people kind of like discover wrestling through friends or family. They go to box office, you know, they go to the live shows. And that's the primary way that Japanese companies make money is through the live gate and through merchandise sales um, at venues and online. Um, so like that, as far as the my hatred of Kenny Omega and Jay White, it's not because they're quote unquote effective heels, because I don't think they're effective heels, because yeah. one, Kenny Omega is a fucking dork. OK, his whole wrestling character from the cleaner to when he was a champion to the point where he lost to Tanahashi, he's a fucking dork. And I don't want a fucking dork being the goddamn fucking champion of the biggest company in, in professional wrestling. As far as Jay White goes, I don't hate Jay White as a wrestler. I think actually Jay White is a very good wrestler, but I hate his character. I hate the switchblade because it's a square peg trying to be fit into a round hole of like, I'm a heel. He's like a mustache twirling supervillain in, in the way he presents himself. And then his all his wrestling matches since he became the switchblade are, have all follow a formula that I hate. Let's throw the guy into the barricade 17 fucking times. Let's have Ghetto cheat in all my matches. I'm going to do and then I'm going to do all these contrived bullshit closing stretches where i'm gonna i'm gonna put you in the blade runner no you're gonna get out of it oh you're gonna put me in your move i'm gonna get out of it it's, it's, it's just like it's worse people complain about akata doing this shit listen jay white is 100 times fucking worse it has nothing to do with him being a quote-unquote effective heel because he's not an effective heel because he's annoying i don't hate him i just find him annoying i'd say like kenny omega as a heel no he's just a dork and that's my answer to that question I always appreciate when, I mean, when you really just ride the fence and don't give a, a strong answer one way or the other, WH. Listen, you people want the, the truth and honesty for me. I give it to you. It always comes. It always comes uh, very, very fast and furious. You never know when you're going to get a, a WH rant. Uh, next one here from the professor. How do you guys see the separation coming with the IWGP and intercontinental titles? Uh since they seem to be defended together, will this lead to uh, just the titles being uh, unified and elevating the U.S. and never belts? And uh, yeah, let's uh, just just talk about that. Do you see, Dylan, for the foreseeable future that these titles will be uh, just uh, attached together for the foreseeable future? I think it's more likely they're together until the fans come back, uh, you know, like a full show to try and have that extra – bullet in the chamber to draw more fans to show have another main event caliber title uh, i think that'll happen but right now i think they're going to stay together for now uh you know they, they don't really need to bring them apart there's really just no need to split them apart right now i like the double title situation with it i think it's kind of cool i think that the intercontinental title is very like they go out of their way to make this as worthless as possible for some reason if you look at their promos naito's always talking how much he doesn't want it he doesn't like it and now okada's like man the world title used to be great until that ic title got, got in there now it really lost a lot of value so i thought i, I thought that was a very funny interview that they did there about the IC title. What a very valuable commodity that is. Hopefully they can elevate the Never title. I don't think the US title means anything, to be honest. I think it would be much better served on whatever their US projects is uh, going forward. They seem to be doing more of that lately. So I would love if the US title became the king of the US shows and the Never title was the effective secondary title. I think that's a perfect way to do it. But right now, I think they're, and I do think that they are going to stay together until the fans come back. Yeah, I agree with everything Dylan said. The, the most likely scenario I see is when Okada wins that title, whenever that might be, he's going to take that IC title belt 
if it's still part of the championship, and he's going to throw it in the, in the trash and say, this is garbage. I don't need this one. I just want to carry one. And this is the one I'm going to carry. And then bye-bye, white belt. Uh, Brilliant. <laughs> Rob asks, what is the main event on January 4th, 2021, and how does Ghetto get there via the G1 and the fall shows? So let's uh, let's start with you, WH, if, you, if we are – uh, assuming we are getting a Tokyo Dome card on January 4th, uh, what is your main event that you're forecasting today? Uh, I'm going to say, I think I said this earlier, but Tetsuya Naito versus Hiromu Takahashi for the IWGP heavyweight title. And I guess like Hiromu wins the G1 Climax. My heart wants that to happen so much because I always advocate for Hiromu. I, I, I've been on him for years that this guy could be the top star in the company. Uh, it gets a, a lot of opposition for some reason <laughs> about about that. Many people were like, no, he, he must be a junior. He can never challenge for the title, uh, the main title. But I was like, no, this guy can be like the top star. And that, if that happened, I think that would be a great story. They have all of the storyline pieces, too to make that an interesting match and something that the fans will care about. It could be a legitimately drawing match for the dome. If there are fans or if it's somewhere else, I think one way or the other, if somehow the dome, they cannot run the dome on the fourth, there's going to be some kind of show that they're going to do with a title match. Uh, even if it's not at the dome itself. Uh, so I do anticipate there will be a title match on that day. And that would be an amazing one. My cynical side. I know that they've, that they've thankfully, They've almost swayed me away from thinking this because if they hadn't have done all the stuff with the King of Pro Wrestling title, I would have thought for sure this was going to happen. But I think you could never count out Okada winning the, the G1 in New Japan and getting a title shot. But thankfully, they've really booked him away from that to where they're making sure that like, hey, he's basically saying I won't be in the title picture anytime soon. So that will leave Hiromu. What are the other options you would think? Because there's nobody really built up. At this, you know, at the moment, Tanahashi and Ibushi are doing tag team stuff. You know, Ibushi would be somebody that would be on my list of people that you would want to elevate. Jay is always a, a prospect as well. They really love pushing him, but he's not in the country right now. You know, as as we know, uh, he's an out. He's a sleeper pick, and I don't like saying that. If it's not Hiromu, I think Jay is a potential winner and he's able to come there. If all of the stars align, he would be somebody that might be the second in command choice because I just don't see where else they could go besides Hiromu at the moment, uh, considering Okada is presumably out of the title picture. Yeah. I kind of lean with Dylan because my first thought is if Jay White is available, like, and on top of that, like I, I will be surprised. I know you guys are expecting Naito to win this title back, but for them to just, Go all the way with this evil thing and then take the title off him so quickly that I, I, I have a hard time imagining evil and Jay White being your uh, January 4th <laughs> main event as they battle for uh, leadership of the Bullet Club. Uh, but I do see that being some kind of program at, at whatever point Jay White comes back. Uh, so I, I guess it creates like how invested are they with evil? Because if he loses that title on the 29th. I will think that this will be a, a colossal failure of just – and really not learning from what they d had to do with Jay White as that Band-Aid solution yeah. and then losing the title. It's – whether you are a fan of the guy or not, he wasn't even given the chance because he was immediately pegged as transitional champion and had to come back from that. And I think that's – that's just such a obstacle that you're putting on someone's shoulders to have to overcome and that will – I don't think Evil will be able to recover from that. Um, and, and maybe you could argue was Evil the best pick because an alternative pick to do the exact same story with a Shingo, I think that would have been met with, with a ton of positivity and would have certainly given you a lot more dynamic matches than we've gotten from Evil so far. But – yeah, I, I'm kind of leaning with Dylan that I could see Jay White, if he's in the G1, being the winner and then challenging on January 4th. The question being, who is your champion by then? It could be Okada, and we're going to get some circus match on January 4th with every bell, <laughs> oh. whistle, and C4 explosive uh, that the fans vote on. No, and balloons. Maybe the balloons are coming back. I guaranteed oh. pop. Crowd can't make noise, but balloons can. So there we go. There you go, Dan. <laughs> <laughs> triple, triple title match. We'll get the IWGP, the IC, the King of Pro Wrestling, and throw in the U.S. title as well. We're going to up the ante from <laughs> this past year. Four titles all merging together. I'd be in my glory if they consolidated four titles. Alexander from Portland writes, uh, 
do Japanese fans care about American promotions outside of WWE? Uh, he's got a few questions here. Uh, with Gallows and Anderson supposedly able to work New Japan dates, how do you think New Japan's commentary will deal with their affiliation with Impact Wrestling, uh, such as if they were to win championships and would they wear them on screen? And lastly, the New Japan ROH Madison Square Garden show last year received mixed reviews in America. The New Japan show or part won the acclaim of people while the ROH parts were not well received. Is this how Japanese fans viewed the event as well? Uh, So a lot there. Uh, Let's start with you, WH, on interest in non-WWE US-based companies by by the average Japanese fan. Obviously, there are pockets that are going to be following tons of stuff. Well, most Japanese wrestling fans are loyal to one company, yeah. right? So they there's very little crossover in my experience between like you know New Japan to All Japan. So like WWE fans like WWE, they don't like Japanese wrestling for the most part. People who go to like the Ryugoku Koku Gikan WWE shows or the Osaka Edeon Arena shows, these are WWE stands. They love the WWE. They love NXT. They don't give a shit about New Japan or All Japan. Uh, conversely, I think anyone who's an AEW fan probably loved like Young Bucks and Kenny Omega. And so when they went to form AEW, they took those Japanese fans with them, right? So like so Fat Masa, probably not coming to any more New Japan shows. Uh, but he's probably like watching AEW religiously to hopefully get a mention of his name on their TV show. But yeah, to, that's the question. Like, no, there's there's very little crossover of like Japanese like pro res fans to sports entertainment. And that number in general has to be pretty low, like of Japanese fans who care about non WWE American wrestling. Maybe AEW has a little bit, but like Ring of Honor and Impact, they have uh you know they've tried to do shows in Japan and not been very successful uh, outside of maybe the uh, the New Japan and Ring of Honor shows they did, and even that wasn't uh you know. They had ups and downs spurts, but to me, it just seems like a really small subset of fans that would even care about an impact or a ring of honor. I think you get the subset of fans who like Lucha Libre, right? Because like there are yeah. those subset fans who like to go to like the CMML shows with New Japan and like they just and there's a there's a set portion of fans who, who love Lucha Libre and they don't watch Japanese wrestling. Um, but as far as like non WB, no, no, like as far as like the, the question about, uh, you know, uh, Anderson and Gallows, if they won the title with what with Japanese commentators, they don't care about mentioning other companies. They just talk about like pro wrestling Noah in relation to Kenta. They'll talk about like Ishimori was in Dragon Gate and then he went to Noah, blah, blah, blah. Like they don't care. Like, will they say, oh, these guys wrestle for impact? Sure. Like, I guess if they, they don't, they don't have to, but if they want to, they can. It doesn't matter. Um, if the like, Anderson Gals win the impact world tag team titles, will they wear them on TV? I, I don't think New Japan cares one way or another. I can't remember if, like, I'm sure ROH, yeah, ROH champions wore their title. So, like, I, I'm sure if, New J- if Ghetto said, like, you know what, Okada still got heat with that company. You can't wear those belts. But, I mean, apparently he doesn't because he's using their fucking ideas for this King of Pro Wrestling title. So, anyways. <laughs> um, and the ROH New Japan show, I, I think... You know, that's a pretty universal opinion most had of what worked and what did not work on that particular show last year. Yeah, for sure. Uh, what are this is from Martin Bushby. What are WH's top three best worst wrestling gear outfit costumes of all time? This is really putting you on the spot, WH. So if you have to defer, we can uh, come back later. Um. Okay. Top three best. Top of my head, like just thinking about it. Um. Uh, Naomichi Marafuji, like I just like his look throughout his whole entire career. So <laughs> anything that he's wearing, like I like, um, I don't know, like you know, Kobashi's orange pants, orange trunks, the Orange Crush era of of Kenda Kobashi, and of course Jushin Thunder Liger. Um, I'm a big fan of Black Liger. Like I like, I love the classic red and yeah, uh, red and white. But Black Liger is probably my favorite version of him. Uh, top worst three. Fuck. Bad luck, Fale. Top of my head. That's he's up there. <laughs> uh, uh, Jados. I don't care. I've been in this business 30, 30 years. Actually, I like that t shirt. Everything else is skeleton shit. Fuck that stuff. That's garbage. And let's see. Um, you know, uh, do you remember Deep Drunkards in, in Dragon Gate Dylan? Then they wore those oh. coveralls. That was yes. garbage. Okay, Th- and, that was and, bad. Yeah, and, and and honorable mention goes to the entirety of Voodoo Murders in the early two thousands. All Japan, all those guys look like shit. 
that was uh, Taru was going to be one of my picks <laughs> suggestions as one of the worst looks uh, of all time for sure. Um, you know, always I feel like the mask guys always stand out for this. Guys like Liger, Ultimo Dragon, I always thought had a, a great look. Even someone like El Samurai, I always loved the mask that he had. Uh, in Joshi, there's been a lot of all kinds of cool looks and things like that. Like Bull Nakano with her hair, yeah, I think has yeah. to be an iconic look at, for me. Um, a lot of the guys nowadays in New Japan, they've kind of gotten away because I one of the things I loved in All Japan was the color-coded wrestlers, like orange for Kobashi, green for Misawa, black and yellow for Kawada, red for Tawe. In New Japan, they kind of have guys with a lot of different colors all, all blended into their outfits pretty much. Uh, outside of uh, Nakamura was very known for his red attire, so to speak. But now they have a lot of different stuff. It's not as color-coded as it was in the old days. But that's something I think I would love to see make more of a return uh, in the future because I think it's just a very cool thing. Like uh, It's not a big deal, but it's a very cool thing in my opinion. Just one quick note before we move on is that Akira Hokuto has the greatest beer yes, of yes. any Joshi in the history of professional wrestling like whether it's in europe america or japan she had the best gear best entrance gear and the best like you know in-ring gear when she was like actually having her match and the entrance gears that she had was unbelievable on on some of those shows especially with the huge ramps that they used to have at joshi it was like a totally again an iconic entrance any anybody in the 90s had like some if they were a big star in joshi they had some kind of iconic look that you would go with and she was right near the top of the list best cutaway too after Kensuke Sasaki and Kenta Kobashi and Sasuke is addressing everyone <laughs> yes. and they just cut to her. She was fantastic at everything. Last thing is uh, Jesse from The Six. If I recall correctly, months ago, WH said that he saw Evil as a likelier IWGP champion than Sonata, primarily because Evil came up through the New Japan Dojo while Sonata did not. Therefore, Evil is more of their guy. Do I remember this correctly? If so, does WH think this will be a long reign for Evil or at least not a tra- tra- transitional one? And does this mean WH suspects that Sonata will never hold that title? Or is it more nuanced than that? So we want to get into WH's uh, deep thoughts here. We kind of talked about this uh, regarding evil. Yeah, I'm pretty sure I said something to that effect. But I I think a lot of it had to do with the – at the time that, you know, from people who knew, like who knew Sonata that that I talked to, that Sonata wasn't signed with New Japan. It, I don't know if he's, he's even signed now. Like For the longest time, he was working for that company without a contract. They're never going to put the title on a guy who doesn't have a contract. That's why that you know Ibushi has never won the title and was probably never going to win the title until he signed an actual contract. And yeah, like they tend to favor their dojo guys, the guys in the Young Alliance system, more than outsiders. But you know they, they've had tons of outsiders win their titles. Like... Um, you know, like, you know, Bob Sapp won the title. That was a, <laughs> that was a stunt. But, you know, like Tenru, you know, he didn't come through their title, but he was a big star when he came, when he won the title. Um, I, I'm, th- I'm sure there are other people like, you know, AJ wasn't a, one of their guys, you know, like he's a contract guy, but he didn't come through their, their thing. I think with Sonata, like, I think he's lost something. Like when he first joined the company, I was very high on him. In the last year or so, like, I think he's kind of slotted himself in – in a, in a persona that I don't think is a money draw. Um, but there's a lot of nuances to who they pick to be their title, you know, their, their champion. And, and it has to do more with like who they think is marketable. And it could be like someone like Okada who, you know, y- you can argue is part of their system, but he, you know, he originally started with Ultimo Dragon and then he moved to, to, to the Japan Dojo system. But you know, like in the last couple of years, yeah, who is it? Okada, Tanahashi, Naito, they're all dojo guys. Jay White, dojo guy, evil dojo guy, you know, like, and it's very rare that they don't put it on a dojo guy. So, yeah, I think part of it is also like they, you know, if you sign with New Japan when you're starting off in wrestling, there is a, you know, like, there's a kind of guarantee that maybe if you work really hard, they will reward your loyalty with becoming, you know, the IWGP champion, but that's not necessarily a guarantee of that either. What you're saying is that if someone comes up in the dojo and then they make the ultimate sacrifice, they go to live in Mexico for two years, the payback is that we are going to have the ultimate character for you when you come back and the world (laughs) is your oyster, Master Watto. Well, listen, I think we can agree, John, that Master Watto was never going to become the IWGP (laughs) champion with, with or without this stupid gimmick. But, I mean, that being said, I think if he, you know, he has a good chance of winning the IWG Junior Heavyweight title if 
he loses his gimmick or he really tweaks it to get rid of the crappy the crappy long boys. Everything. To get and, rid of everything. And, and the, yes, get everything. Rid of the, just, just become Hirai Kawato or the great Kawato and just wear face paint and spray green mist. Even that would be better, okay? But, this thing sucks. Yeah. This thing is so awful. And it's <laughs> it's even the worst because when he first came back, it was almost like this ironic enjoyment of this character that now it's complete indifference. Oh. He might as well not even exist other than he's the fall guy for Tanahashi and Ibushi Six Mans. You know, I got I got I think this might be a first. Master Wado might be a first, John. That you hate something more than I do, because I I do think you hate Master Wado way more than I do. Because I really enjoy the wrestler. I really thought that this guy, that you know, I I was a fan of him like during his his young yeah. lion run, and was very disappointed that like he did very little in Mexico and coming back here just to even hit the reset button on him. They came up with this god awful thing that I think is as bad as as Akira Tozawa right now. Um. Yeah, I just think it's a it's an awful, awful gimmick that he's not overcoming. And they've just – they've got a successor now for Yoshihashi, who I think also has a, a pretty terrible gimmick. I knew you hated that because that's like the third time you brought up Watto and, we, there's, and he's had nothing to do with anything. But you just want to pitch in that he sucks and, and this gimmick pretty much. So I, I do love that you have that passion, John, for Master Watto and this awful, awful gimmick. Uh, I compared his vignettes. It feels like they've turned him into plays with squirrels. He went off in the woods somewhere because he had no friends. And I think that that is his gimmick, truly. That and a combination of Rolf from Ed, Ed and Eddie, I think is, is definitely his gimmick right now. And just a, a no no way he would ever be the champion. But I agree with you, John. Him as Young Lion Kawato was a great, like, fiery baby face. Why, why is that so hard for people to cut to – book in that way because when he was in mexico they put him as a heel as a rudo and he sucked man he was like uh, he had no way of getting around the lucha style and being a heel that way and then he comes back to japan and he's like this fake martial arts guy and not even a good one at that and blue and everything about it sucks man uh, it's just terrible you know it's just very bad stuff but uh, I I do hope that it can continue at least a little while longer because I want to see how far you're going to push this. How much hatred will this gimmick stir in you, John? Probably a lot because I don't think I've hit my my breaking point yet. I think I think there's more left in me okay. to to conjure. Um, but that will have to uh, rest for for another month as we uh, come to a close <laughs> of this month's show. And Dylan, I want to thank you very much uh, for joining us this month. It was a lot of fun to have you on and chat about uh, so many topics ranging from Master Watto to gear to all things in between and many tournaments uh but do direct our listeners to where they can catch more of you with the eastern lariat podcast i know you guys have uh, a patreon so the floor is yours thank you so much for having me on both of you uh john I, like i i have told you this on twitter before but you were a big inspiration to me personally uh watching you or listening to you and way show back in the day i've always been a supporter of you guys and to be on this show is awesome. And WH, you're a great friend, great source of knowledge. You know, you've been watching this stuff for uh, way longer than even me. Uh, you know, and I've watched it for a pretty long time myself. But still, you are you are the true grandmaster of the pro res scene, in my my opinion. But um, yeah, if everybody wants to hear more of me, I co-host the Eastern Lariat with my good friend Striga from CageMatch.net. Uh, he has made appearances on WH's show as well, and. Um, we both work on cage match and stuff. And so that's really cool. Always go to cage match.net. If you want to have a good resource for wrestling, vital resource, uh, the Eastern there. Yes. Very good. Especially if you actually host a podcast as well, or want to look smart to your friends, go to cage match. You can search literally anything up and it'll pop up pretty, pretty well for you. Um, I've made my presence felt now that I work more on the, on that website. I've edited many things, usually inconsequential things, uh, like putting the dark agents uh, on, on their profile, uh, Saito and Inoue and Noah. But also check out our Patreon, patreon.com slash Eastern Lariat. You get to hear all kinds of cool shows, and not even just about Japanese wrestling. Sometimes we talk about American wrestling. I do every time they do a big AEW WWE Impact pay-per-view, I, I suffer through it and, and watch it. Even the eyeball match I watched, and what a crazy show that was. But also the 90s project, we talk about classic wrestling from the 90s. Uh, me and my good friend Fredo Esparza is, is on there with me. Um, I, we've got people from all over the place. Me and Hisame, great Noah resource, did a whole 
show about Pro Wrestling Noah, the entire history of it. You learn a lot if you if you go to our Patreon. Uh, we've got some merchandise coming out too uh, that I've shown WH, and he's very uh, he was very complimentary to my design work uh, as well. Much like BB Hulk in Dragon Gate, I also do the design for us, but. Uh, anytime you want to see some Japanese wrestling, I know what's going on. And not just New Japan, but all the companies. Uh, somewhat similar to this show, but ours is uh, multiple times a month. One, you know, up to three or four times. Sometimes even more than that with tournaments. On the Patreon, we're going to cover all the tournaments. I'm making an effort to cover the DDT, the Tokyo Joshi Pro, the Stardom, the NOAA, All Japan, and New Japan. All of them will be covered on the Patreon. So for $5, what, what kind of value is that? It's just crazy stuff. Check it out. And thank you so much for listening. Thank you so much for the questions. And thank you for supporting post pro res. Yes. So you can check that out. Patreon.com slash Eastern Lariat and WH, you are going to be back. It is once again, a weekend of WH park here at post wrestling.com. And who is coming up on the latest edition of the long and winding Royal road. Well, it's a independent technical master, uh, Daniel Makabe, and we're going to talk about a match from January 1992. Kenta Kobashi, Siyoshi Kikuchi, uh, one of the greatest tag teams in the history of All Japan Pro Wrestling, taking on another one of the greatest tag teams in the history of All Japan Pro Wrestling, and that's Saruta Gun, Jumbo Saruta, and Akira Tawe. And my God, like, if you watch this match, and John, I hope you, if you haven't watched the match yet, just you know, get to the, let me know what you think about the atomic drop. And you'll know what I'm talking about when you see this atomic drop that nearly broke my spine when I saw it. And I talk about this atomic drop in, in great detail with Daniel, along with a lot of love for, for the greatness of Jumbo Suruta and, and his tag team with Akira Tawai. But oh, we also go very hard on the love for one Siyoshi Kikuchi, who is a great, great underrated wrestler from that era. Well, you can check that show out Sunday, coming to postwrestling.com with Daniel Makabe as this month's guest. Again, a big thank you to Dylan Fox for joining us. You can catch all of his fine work with Striga at the Eastern Lariat Podcast. And WH and I will be back next month uh, to navigate through 5,000 tournaments and uh, find out whatever else is going on. And uh, Dylan's head will be spinning covering every single one of these tournaments. So uh, thank you to WH and Dylan, and we'll be back next month.